could just wait for the end there. Yep, that's done. Okay. Okay, good evening. My name is Fiona Pegram, and on behalf of Trasna Natira and Limavadi Ancestry, we welcome you to tonight's talk by Dr. Cormac McSparren, archaeologist of Queen's University, Belfast. He has directed and published a number of important excavations and has a very wide range of research interests. Tonight, he'll be speaking on burials and society in early Bronze Age Ireland. Before he starts, if you have any questions throughout the talk, if you could just pop them into the Q&A and we'll deal with them afterwards. Thank you. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a delight uh, to speak to you tonight. Uh, I'm going to speak, uh, as, as, as Fiona has, has mentioned, mostly about, uh, well, the Bronze Age, really, uh, Bronze Age burial. Uh, but I'm going to I'm going to widen it out a little bit. I'm going to start and sort of try and put the Bronze Age into context with talking a little bit about Irish prehistory before the Bronze Age, and uh, and you never know, I might even talk a wee bit about Irish prehistory in the later Bronze Age and heading maybe even beyond that very slightly. But mostly, I'm going to concentrate on the early Bronze Age and I'm going to discuss how archaeologists can use. Uh, burial and the study of burial as a window, as an insight really into looking at the way that uh, society works and society is structured. So uh, I'm just going to start off here and share my screen if I can. Now, I don't know, let's just so share this screen and I'll just try and start a slideshow. So I'm always a wee bit, can everybody see that screen okay? Yes, that's fine. That, that, that's 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 good. Uh, there's a uh, the odd wee thing has dropped off it actually, but don't <laughs> don't worry about that. The screens are illustrative and mostly prompts. Uh, I think actually it's dropping off the bottom. But bear with me just one wee second here. I'm going to look and see why. Ah, oh, it's okay. It's nothing really. We're just losing the bottom quarter of an inch of the of the the, the slide, but. Uh, so, as I say, I'm going to really sort of try and contextualise this in two ways. I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute or two about uh, the, the, the prehistory, the early prehistory of Ireland. But I also want to start off by talking a little bit about how archaeologists think about society. Until, really, the, the, the post-war years, archaeology was, was a subject which was dominated by ideas of common sense. So what seemed to fit, nothing wrong with that. And it very much uh, was, explanation in archaeology was very much based on biblical analogies very often or classical analogies. The sort of the learning of the, of, of, of the, 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 the 18th, well, post-medieval post era, the sort of 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, the sort of rediscovery of Greece and Rome, and uh, studies, of course, of, of the Bible, had, uh, had, had led to a sort of a, a series of explanatory models for, for the past. But these explanatory models, as, as archaeologists found out more and more through the 20th century, as there was more excavation, better excavation, at the beginning of scientific archaeology, sort of real carbon dating and, and, and environmental archaeology, uh, there was a realization that the models that were being used to explain the past weren't really up to the job. Uh, the, the, the classical analogies and the biblical analogies were, were, were fine in the classical world and the biblical world, but there was a whole a variety of different societal types across the world and even within uh, ancient Europe which couldn't really be encapsulated very well by those models. So archaeologists started to look beyond uh, the, the, the sort of uh, the, 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 the confines of certain classical and biblical archaeology and they started to look towards anthropology in particular. And this happened a lot in America because in America anthropology and archaeology are really much more branches of the one subject. In, in, in Europe and in Britain and Ireland in particular, archaeology had always sat beside history and to a certain extent geography and classical studies. And, uh, but in America, it was very much uh, uh, something that was uh, hand in glove with anthropology. And that allowed them an international perspective. Uh, and also it allowed archaeologists to start to think in the way that anthropologists do about how society is built, if you like, how society is structured. And uh, really some of the concepts that, that, that underpin uh, anthropology, uh, in a sense they go right back to Marx, 
uh, not in a political way, but uh, in, 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 in a sort of the idea of the economy underpinning society. Uh, so uh, really until the mid 19th century, although it seems a, an obvious thing to us nowadays, there generally wasn't a, a, a match up in people's thought patterns between the idea that a complex society had to have a complex economy. Uh, but in the 19th century and, and early 20th century, this became much more firmly established. It, obviously something like Rome could not have had its grandeur if it hadn't had a fairly sophisticated economic base uh, to, 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 to to underpin it. And similarly, when you get to, to very uh, simple societies, like the Kalahari Bushmen, the San, or something like that, you'll find that there's maybe a much uh, simpler economic base underpinning that society. Uh, and uh, so anthropologists start to think about different types of societies, different categories of societies. To use the term that's something that's often used by anthropologists and archaeologists is typology. So different, different types of societies. And, uh, and, and how these different types of societies were linked to the economic base, really. And what became apparent is that there's a, a sort of a direct relationship between the type of economy, the type of society, and also how much that society, uh, well, all, see, I was going to say how hierarchical each society is. All societies have hierarchy, all human societies have hierarchy. But most human societies through the, the, the history of, 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 of humanity have not had societies where hierarchy has been passed on from one generation to the next. So in almost all human societies, up until a relatively few thousand years ago, uh, hierarchy or status was achieved by the individual. And it was achieved through their personal qualities uh, or the things that they had managed to do during life. So you can look at, uh, say, for instance, some uh, sort of Plains Indians and stuff like that. In some respects, a reasonably complex society. But and they had quite a lot of hierarchy. The chiefs, for instance, as we all know from, from all of the movies we watched as kids. But in, in, in most of those, not all, but in most of those Plains Indian societies, uh, the rank of, say, chief, was achieved by the individual uh, uh, Native American through the through the passage of their life. So they had to fight in a war. They had to leave tribal area. Uh, they, they, they had to have the members of certain groups and achieve certain grades within certain groups and within their society, like medicine societies or other sorts of things like that. So essentially you got a lot of notches on your belt until you reached the level at which you would be recognized by your peers as being a chief. And that's quite a complex version of a society in which hierarchy is, is achieved. But then the next stage, if you like, and, and, and I don't like to use the word stage, because these things don't necessarily run in a linear sort of direction with time. But the next, if you like, more complex level of social development tends to come when the, the ranking, if you like, the, 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 the status, the hierarchy that you achieve is no longer achieved but it is ascribed to you at the moment of your birth by, by, by the position in society of your parents, grandparents, ancestors. And that's a new social stage. And uh, to think about it very simply, uh, they sure see there's a, a sort of big graph here, the graph diagram on the right. Uh, it's a, a wee bit more complex than probably needs to be uh, for tonight as purpose. But if you look at the bottom line, you sort of go from the, the simplest societies tend to be organized into to bands, uh, which are, say, hunter-gatherer societies, like the San uh, in, in Southern Africa or, 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 or the uh, Aborigines in, 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 in Australia. And uh, they, 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 they tend to be societies which have a hunting and gathering base, and they, they, they're societies which are generally uh, quite self-sufficient, uh, and they don't need huge scale uh, social structures. So a band is typically 50 to 100 people. And within that 50 to 100 people, there'll be all the specialization, all the crafts that you need. And also it's very often large enough to support you know, a, a reasonable uh, degree of, or, you know, of, of, of uh, lack, lack of inbreeding, if you've, if you've seen some a group of about 100 people together. So that's generally for, for simple societies is what anthropologists categorize as a sort of simple social structure, the basic band. The next level up from that, if you like, is the tribe. 
And the tribe is a, is a substantially more complex grouping, and it tends to emerge with early agriculturalists. There's a degree of com social complexity which comes from all the different roles that are needed in, uh, in a slightly more complex society. And then in these societies, you tend to get uh, much, well, the tribe itself could have several thousand people within it, and typically the tribes tend to be divided up into groups, several groups of four or five hundred individuals, which are called segments of tribe. I'm going to leave out big man and achieved rank tribes. Achieved rank, by the way, are a bit like the Plains Indians, where you achieve your rank through life, and they're quite complex. They're almost at the next stage of, of if you like, societal development, which is the chiefdom. And the chiefdom is when you move to proper aristocracies, whenever you start to get a real distinction between the poor and a real distinction between the, the, those who have uh, elite status, if you like, the, 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 the ruling group of the society. Uh, chiefdoms can be quite simple, and it can only be small parts of the economy uh, which are controlled by the chiefly group, maybe one sector of the economy, or there can be much more complex, something much more like royal, uh, what we would think of as royal societies, where, if you like, all... Uh, benefit comes from the, 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 the position of the king. All land holding ultimately comes from the king. The king is the sort of the center of, 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 of everything in the, in, in, the, in the society. And then of course, those sort of royal societies grade into what we would think of as, as states, which well, in different parts of the world, they emerge at different times. Ancient Egypt was probably a sort of proto-state. Rome was certainly a state. In the later Middle Ages in Europe, you start to see the emergence of proper states uh, as well as we would recognize them now. <coughs> and before I start talking about actual archaeology, I'll, I'll bore you with a little bit more theory just before we, we move on. Uh, hand in hand with this, because we're talking about society, just want to mention a little bit about how archaeologists think about death. And again, for for uh, uh, for, for generations, archaeology used a combination of common sense and biblical and classical analogies to understand death. Uh, and very often, our Christian heritage in, in, in Europe and, and America, or at least most of our most of us anyway, uh, heavily influenced that too. And uh, it, it influenced what we think of as our common sense, because of course. We, we always imagine that com, you know, my common sense, of course, is common sense. It makes sense, but it makes sense because of the, 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 the cultural and, and ideological and, and, and ideas that I've sort of grown up around as to what common sense is. And sometimes to understand other societies, we have to step out of that, that a little bit because their common sense is different from our common sense. And Lewis Binford that was really the first, well, one, of, one of the first, the first big sort of name uh, in the 1960s. Uh, to start thinking about how we can step outside of, of our ways of understanding the relationships between death and, and society and things like that. And he observed that, uh, not, uh, uh, not dissimilar to the things I've talked about in the last slide, that there was, in, in most cases anyway, a direct relationship between the complexity of a society and the complexity of the burial ritual. So, for instance, if you look at something like uh, the, 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 the Australia, hunter-gatherer groups in Australia, uh, pre-contact, uh, they tended to have, in fact, up until 100 years or so, many of them tended to have very simple burial rituals. Uh, he noticed that more complex societies where the individual uh, lived in a, in, in, in a more interconnected world, where the individual had uh, maybe a number of different uh, social personas, as he called it, as Binford called it, that those tended all to be reflected in different ways in the burial and that, uh, or, or the burial ritual, uh, so that the more complex the society, the more complex the roles that the individual had to, uh, if you like, act out in that society, then the more complex the burials uh, tended to be. Uh, this was added to uh, by, by, by a couple of other guys uh, who sort of, Lewis Binford's theories were, 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 were very good and very theoretical, but they actually weren't that easy to operationalize on the ground, uh, partly because, well, you know, how do you, so, how, how do you quantify complexity? Uh, it's, it's easy enough maybe to, 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 to qualify it in the sense to, to, to write about it in vague terms, but to actually nail down what complexity is can be quite difficult. So uh, Tinder was, 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 was an archaeologist in the early 1970s who began to realize that you could 
uh, sort of try and come up with estimations of the amount of effort or energy that had been put into the rituals surrounding burial, that that was maybe a, a very good uh, proxy, if you want, for actual complexity, social complexity. So if they if they thought something was 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 worth expending a lot of effort on, that was a reasonable indication that that was a complex ritual for for maybe a significant person. And then there was another couple of guys, uh, Peebles and Cuss, who were working on chiefdoms, and they in particular, studying chiefdoms, figured out that there seemed to be a, a number of underlying principles to the, the, the burial rituals of these chiefdoms. Uh, that there would be a, a lower class of burials, which would be uh, where, where, where all the differentiation would be down to sex and or age, really. So children would get, uh, typically anyway, uh, uh, young children would, would, would rarely be buried on their own, uh, and if they were buried on their own, it would be a very simple burial ritual. Adult males, uh, adult females would get a more burial, a, a more a more uh, fulsome burial ritual, and then there would be a higher class within that chiefdom society where you would find that all age groups and sexes could be evenly represented because, of course, your birth was giving even newborn babies more status than, uh, than, than maybe some adults in the lowest class of burials. And then he suge they suggested that in these chiefdoms there would be an elite class who would probably could be composed mainly, if not exclusively, of adult males uh, from their experience of studying chiefdoms, and that they would typically be buried with clear symbols of wealth and power, or would be at a, a certain status mark, if you like, uh, higher than, than, than other burials at the time. Uh, just before I go on to setting the scene about archaeology, just to go back for a second, uh, it's probably worth mentioning that uh, although it's it can be stated that Whenever you see a complex burial ritual, you probably have a complex society. You can't always say the reverse. You can't always say that every complex society is going to have a complex burial ritual because we do know of some examples where that doesn't happen. And this was pointed out by a really interesting archaeologist, English archaeologist called Mike Parker Pearson. Some of you might have heard of him. Uh, he's done a lot of work in Stonehenge, but he also did quite a lot of work between 18th, 19th and 20th century burials in Britain. And he looked in particular at burials in, in, the, in, in the Cambridge area, and he uh, noticed that while it was definitely true that in the 18th and 19th century there was a direct relationship between, well, the biggest burials in the graveyard were you know, the, where, where the burials of the Maloners, you know, um, the, the pauper's burial was a simple wooden cross at another corner of the, 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 the graveyard. You can see that because like the city cemetery in Belfast would be a great example of that, where these fantastic mausoleums, very often with all sorts of uh, sort of classical and Egyptian and all sorts of uh, uh, Cleopatra's needles and things like that uh, for, for, for the rich industrialists of Belfast and then other parts of the, gra of the, of the, the, the graveyard burials are much, much simpler. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of complexity and variety in, 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 the, in that cemetery, which reflects a, a complex society, but a very complex society. But what, what Mike Parker Pearson noticed is that sometime in the early 20th century, that all stopped. The, the, by the time you get through to the 1930s and 40s, burials for all, everybody in the land is, is are, are quite plain. There's much less differentiation between the burials of the wealthy and the burials of, of the poor. Uh, and, uh, but, I mean, well, Mike Parker Pearson realised that we had not suddenly gone back a thousand years or two and become a much less complex society in the mid-20th century. He realised that something had happened and this, the thing that he thought had happened was the First World War that he detected that as early as the 1920s people were starting to bury the rich and the poor in a much more similar manner than they had done in the 19th century. And he believed this was a reaction to the war, uh, people coming back from the war and maybe realising that you know differences in status were maybe less important than they had thought before they left uh, for the war. And he this because obviously people were giving were giving all their money away, but he described this as a sort of a masking uh, of, of, of status uh, in, in burial practice because of, well, uh, belief 
uh, inequality or, or, or embarrassment or, 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 or a combination of lots of different uh, values, new political values, the rise of the labor movement, the trade unions, all sorts of things were contributing to a sort of a, a masking of status and burial rights. And that's something you have to look out for as well when you're looking at uh, burial society and archaeology. Uh, so to leave all the boring theory stuff uh, for at least for a little while uh, and start talking about some actual archaeology, and many of you will be familiar with some of the stuff I'm going to talk about, a lot of the stuff I imagine I'm going to talk about here. But uh, just to set the scene a little bit uh, and, and, and put Irish prehistory uh, and Irish Bronze Age, Bronze Age into the context of Irish prehistory, uh, and, and, and while, while so doing, talking a little bit about society and social complexity, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about the, 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 the history of settlement in Ireland leading up to the Bronze Age. Uh, th there is very little evidence for human activity in Ireland before the end of the last Ice Age. There may well have been human activity in Ireland before the end of the last Ice Age. Uh, there are one or two artefacts have been found. There are a couple of, of, of stone axes, um, stone flakes of the Neanderthal period, two, three hundred thousand BC have been found. A couple of one out in the Iron Islands, uh, one in a, a quarry in County Down, I think one in County Louth, but very, very small numbers. And that's not really surprising because the, 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 the Irish landmass was completely scraped clean uh, by the glaciers and they just basically wiped everything away and by the time the glaciers uh, left uh, and melted, uh, Ireland was really just a, a society of, of, uh, of, of, of no, uh, no, no soil even, or not society, sorry, landscape of no soil, uh, no uh, uh, no, 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 no soil, no plants, uh, no animals, and any uh, archaeological remains uh, largely probably swept uh, into the Atlantic Ocean by the, the, the glaciers on their, on, on their route sort of north to south across uh, the landmass. Uh, Peter Woodman, a uh, cool rain man, uh, he used to be professor of, of archaeology down in Cork in UCC, he has found, he's deceased unfortunately now, uh, died a few years ago, but he had found uh, a number of caves uh, in the sort of Cork and Kerry area where unfortunately any evidence for humans, but where he did find evidence for uh, between the, 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 the heavy periods of glaciation. And his, his hunch was that wherever you get a uh, Wherever you get large mammals, you're probably going to have uh, humans not too far away from them. So he imagined that it was likely that, that, that there probably was settlement in Ireland before the last Ice Age, but we just don't have any evidence for it. Uh, I say once the, the ice had actually melted, the landscape was very, 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 very rocky and sparse, it was like Icelandic, it was like moonscape. Uh, and it took quite a long time for soils and things that got to reestablish themselves. But combination of uh, sort of erosion, creating sands, and, and the first lichens and stuff like that, bird droppings, establishing plants. Uh, and really, although there's, a, there's just a possibility that there might have been scant human settlement, maybe around 12 or 13,000 BC, there was some in southern Scotland. Uh, the only firm evidence we really have of human activity is, is in Ireland is starting after the Gulf Stream becomes established around 9000 BC, the North Atlantic Drift, which is what gives us the sort of temperate climate uh, we have, because of course we're on the same uh, we're in the same latitude as Hudson Bay in Canada. If it wasn't for the Gulf Stream, we would be, you know, sort of under, under ice for six months, ice and snow for six months of the year, and our rivers and lakes freezing for months at a time. So we we have this mild climate because of the the Gulf Stream. So the earliest human settlement, uh, cut a long story short, uh, you all know this story, I'm sure, Mount Sandal, just outside Coleraine. Uh, roughly 8,000 BC. Uh, excavations uh, again conducted by by, by, by Pete Woodman uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, and uh, he identified a, a hunter-gatherer settlement. He thought it was a semi-permanent settlement, the, the sort of the base camp, if you like, where in, 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 uh, in Woodman's model of the Irish Mesolithic, uh, the population would have ranged from there uh, to go to temporary camps through the landscape uh, during the course of the year to exploit different environmental niches, essentially. Uh, and um, these societies uh, are not, uh, as Thomas Hobbes' famous quote, nasty British and short, the lives in them. Uh, 
they didn't obviously have modern health care, but what they did have was 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 was, was good food. Uh, later societies, actually, farming societies are often more uh, uh, more hungry in some respects, more food insecurity, because hunter gatherer groups uh, typically are, are relatively small in number. Uh, they tend to be tied to the population of the landscape. Fertility isn't that high in most hunter gatherer groups. That's partly because women tend to feed their children themselves for a lot longer. Uh, which has sort of a contraceptive effect. So uh, the reproduction rate in hunter-gatherer societies is probably pretty much you know, two parents to two, to, or two, two parents and two children by the time you take into account you know, a certain amount of higher infant mortality than we would have today. Uh, so the, 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 the carrying capacity of the land tends to be determined by the size of the populations. So the, the population fits the available resources quite nicely. And of course, there are multiple resources. Uh, the excavation at Mount Sandal found dozens of food resources uh, preserved, charred in the hearths and waste pits that were found around the site. Uh, uh, lots of different types of fish, uh, wild birds, uh, lots of different types of uh, of, of, of fruit and there were other things which which weren't detected then which might be detectable nowadays if you did uh, a, a similar uh, excavation uh, people have done a lot of work in recent years uh, identifying odd bits of charred stuff uh, from hearths uh, using electron microscopes which have turned out to be uh, edible tubers and stuff like that in, uh, in, in excavations and in Mesolithic sites in, in Europe and in Britain. So I'm sure the same thing would happen today if you if Mount Sandal uh, was was excavated again. So there are probably dozens, dozens and dozens of resources which are exploitable and being exploited by these people in the landscape. And if if you know if if the if the crab apples fail or the damsons fail, well you know, the hazelnuts are going to be good and the eels will be are, 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 are running and you know there'd be salmon until Christmas. So they're, 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 these people are quite are quite well fed. So uh, uh, as I mentioned, these these societies probably have little social hierarchy. There will be leaders, but they'll achieve leadership through their personal characteristics. You know, are they strong? Are they a good hunter? Uh, are they a good negotiator? Those sort of things will be the the important factors in leadership. And they're relatively small societies, fifty to hundred people. Uh, they, 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 these people make tools, they make flint tools, they make basketry, some of it's very, very nice. Uh, but they, they don't have a huge, they, they have other, lots and lots of, uh, we find the basketry sometimes. Uh, they, 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 they have uh, crafts, but uh, the number of crafts and, and the number of, uh, <laughs> if you like, social roles is relatively limited. And you don't need a huge uh, group of people and, and complex ways of redistributing uh, mm -hmm. sort of wealth and resources around the society in a simple hunter-gatherer uh, band. Uh, so the next big change uh, is, uh, is, is, is after several thousand years of hunting and gathering, uh, farming appears around about 3900 BC, rapidly spreads across the whole of Ireland. Uh, this is a major change. And I seem to have an illustration missing on the bottom right hand side. For some reason, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, bloody computers. Uh, one compared to another, something always drops off. I think it was some illustration of some artifacts. Anyway, uh, first farmers come not just with uh, agricultural technology, but they come with, a, a, if you like, the, a package of other technology with it, uh, including such things as the ability to make ceramics, pots, much more sophisticated stone tools, better stone axes, uh, and of course, the ability to husband animals and to cultivate crops. Uh, in an Irish context, this is almost certainly a migration. Uh, Archaeologists, again, using classical analogies and biblical analogies, were great ones for migration. 60 or 70 years ago, everything was a migration. Everything was caused by migration, or many things anyway. We realize now that migrations are more rare. They do happen. They're more rare, and we're developing better techniques and better uh, theoretical bases, if you like, to identify migrations and sort out what is a migration and what's just uh, technological movement and sharing of ideas. Uh, but certainly there does seem to be solid evidence, I'll be discussing it in the context of the Bronze Age later on, for population movement to Ireland around about 3900 BC. The same population brings far movement brings farming at about the same time to Britain as well. Uh, 
Uh, one of the big things about uh, farming groups, of course, is that population can increase significantly. Uh, and this is because farmers have the possibility to be sedentary. They don't have to move around. Well, they, they can't move around all the time. Uh, they have the possibility of creating a surplus. Uh, so at least in theory, in good years, there's more food than you need simply to feed you yourself at this moment in time. And that allows people to start to think about ideas of, you know, sort of, keeping you know gathering gathering wealth if you like gathering resources to themselves and it changes the way people think in many different ways farming uh yes yeah, so here are some of the photographs here of our pictures here of artifact types you can sort of see the the sort of complexity of that flint tool on the right hand side uh did i have a flint tool mesolithic one uh i'll just go back yeah that's a Mesolithic composite flint tool. Just tiny little shards of flint embedded into uh, either a sort of a harpoon or embedded into a knife. The level of complexity in that flint tool is, you know, so far removed. The material might be the same, but it's for all intents and purposes a completely different technology, a completely different industry. And that requires an awful lot of time to learn. There's a huge amount of skill there. You need to serve a proper apprenticeship, really, to make flint tools of that uh, uh, of that quality and to do it repeatedly, uh, to, 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 to replicate that time in, time out. Uh, so that's a really quite sophisticated craft. And then, of course, as I mentioned, the other thing that we, we, we associate uh, Neolithic uh, emergence of Neolithic communities in Ireland and other bits of Western Europe is the appearance of ceramic technology, the appearance of pottery. And these pots, they're not fired in, 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 in modern kilns and they're not made with a potter's wheel, they're built up from coils and they're fired in sophisticated forms of bonfires, but nevertheless you know, there, there is a, 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 a sophistication there, there's a, a, a professionalism in the manufacture uh, especially in Neolithic pottery, actually. Pottery quality drops in the Bronze Age, probably as, the, as, as bronze becomes you know, more, more important. But uh, uh, certainly Neolithic ceramics, early farming ceramics, uh, three, three to 4,000 BC, are really, really good. Uh, and it's a really proper, proper craft. <laughs> and then there, there is, is uh, obviously the stone axe manufacture. Now that happens a little bit in the, in the Mesolithic too, but Stone axes are manufactured on an industrial scale in the, the Neolithic. Sorry, that's my doggy here. This <laughs> is on the dream. <laughs> uh, but uh, the manufacture on industrial scale, you've got literally axe factories where you can still go and pick up thousands of fragments of, of shattered, um, partially completed axes and pieces like teeth, bullion up above cushioned all. Uh, doesn't even have to walk around very, very, very long to pick up a whole host of rough outs and partially finished, uh, broken, discarded bits of, of axes. So, and that's just, I mean, the, the examples here are just scratching the surface of the number of, 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 ne of Neolithic uh, trades. Uh, there, are, there are lots of others which we simply don't see because uh, organic materials generally perish, but we can, we can occasionally find and we can imagine uh, all sorts of crafts involving uh, different types of carpentry, uh, leather crafts, um, uh, carved bone crafts, all sorts of stuff like that, uh, utilising, of course, every bit of the resources of the landscape around them. And when you've got this level of craft specialisation, uh, well, you, 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 you need larger social groups because this 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 say that the flint person who makes these flints, uh, they're dedicating so much of their time to making excellent flints that they may not be able to farm that much. So you start to need barter and exchange, uh, and you, you you've got so many different trades and so many different specialists that you want a larger group to be able to 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 support if you like those different roles, that professionalism, that specialization, where people spend all or at least a good part of their time doing the one thing. So the, the, the suggestion from anthropology is, is that groups cluster in, in, in basic segments of about 500 people. And these segments tend to join together into larger sort of tribal confederacies, maybe two or 3,000 people who will have typically some sort of central gathering spot where they might come to uh, at special times of the year, such as the causeway enclosures, causeway camps like Windmill Hill, that you get a lot in the south of England. We've also found a number of them over here as well. Jim Mallory, Professor Jim Mallory, uh, first excavation I was ever on, 1986, at Dunnigore Hill, uh, near Temple Patrick, 
one of those big causeway camps, causeway closures there. And recently the one's been found in, in, in County Sligo, which is very early radiocarbon dates, right at the very start of the deal, I think about 3900 BC. Uh, and these are these these societies are on on, on a scale of, of, of magnitude of complexity, you know, many many times more complex than hunter gatherer societies. Uh, but we don't, at least at the start of the Neolithic, see that much indication of uh, of of of, of uh, uh, ascribed ranking. Uh, we probably have achieved ranking. Uh, there probably are people of status, but we're still probably talking about a society with status is mostly achieved, at least in the early part of the Neolithic. Uh, uh, so in that respect, a bit like the Plains Indians, or that type of thing, uh, they do not seem to have formed into chiefdoms. But nevertheless, the beginnings of it are, are there. The beginnings of that way of thinking are there because one of the things about farming is, is that it totally changes the way you think uh, conceptually. We here today, or here tonight, uh, uh, are, are, are much closer conceptually in the way we think to the Neolithic farmer of 3900 BC than we are to the hunter-gatherer of just a couple of centuries before that. Uh, because for a start, the hunter, well, well, the, the, the way that we think of time for a start is different. The hunter-gatherer has quite a circular a concept of time. I mean, we do still have circular and linear concepts of time. There's no doubt about that. It's reflected in our year. Of course, the seasons, we have to think that way. But typically, hunter-gatherers don't need to plan ahead much more than really 12 months. So they they, 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 uh, they will be in, in, at their base camp in cold rain uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in the autumn, and then they may be uh, at their uh, at another camp, so maybe in Cushendall in the spring, and then in the autumn they'll be maybe be over in Toon Bridge, and then they'll be back up to 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 or to Cold Rain again uh, by 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 the autumn time. So their 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 year is is planned out with a processional route around the landscape, exploiting different types of foodstuffs, exploiting different types of 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 environmental niches, and probably there are several different groups maybe wandering around uh, County Antrim simultaneously on their own sort of processional. Uh, paths and not that much interacting with each other uh, apart from maybe uh, uh, ma ma potentially marriages and things like that. Uh, but the, 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 the Neolithic farmer thinks about time in a very different way. The Neolithic farmer has cleared the fields, that cut down the trees, the primordial forest, uh, an awful lot of it is cut down at this time. Uh, they, 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 have to, they have to make, they have to make uh, they have to make fences, they have to build field walls, uh, they have to plough, and they have to think about the fertility of the soil going forward, what bits of the land they're going to leave fallow. We're not sure what manuring systems they have or if they practice crop rotation, but certainly these things are all have going to, these concepts of time, investment, long-term fertility are going to be very, very foremost in the minds of Neolithic farmers. And of course, once you put all that effort in, you want to be able to pass that on uh, to your descendants. So the beginnings of the idea of maybe not necessarily ownership of land as such, but the right to use land is, 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 is becoming embedded in human consciousness with the move to agriculture, if you like. And uh, I've, I've shown a few examples here of a couple of, of, of Neolithic tombs. Uh, one from the very start of the Neolithic uh, and one from a little bit later on the Neolithic. The one, the top right hand corner is, you may know it, it's Ternoni Dolmen from just outside Mahara, Ternoni Townland, the, Tur the Ternoni Road just outside Mahara. And uh, I, I actually went at that with the team from Queen's. Uh, a number of years ago, we're going to publication, hopefully later this year, and uh, we, we found a small and simple tomb uh, with dates of about 3,900 BC. And uh, in the bottom, in, in the bottom uh, left hand corner, you'll see uh, a much larger tomb. It's a passage tomb of about 3,000 BC from Loch Cru. And this passage tomb is, uh, is a very interesting one because uh, it uh, 
it has a very long chamber, or sorry, very long passage in a chamber uh, in, in, in the middle, and it's orientated on the equinox sunrise. So uh, yesterday, uh, if you'd have been there uh, yesterday morning at uh, at about seven thirty, you would have seen the sun uh, go down the, the 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 passage into the chamber. But unlike Newgrange, where you have to uh, go into a lottery now. I think you don't even have to book in advance. You have to go into a lottery. You may never get into the the, the centre of the tomb uh, to see uh, mid, mid midwinter sunrise at Newgrange. You can amble up to Loch Crew, and I've done it a few times. Uh, any 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 equinox, uh, apart from apart from this one, of course, with lockdown, and go into the chamber and experience the, the sun shining in. Uh, the, the the passage and it is absolutely awe inspiring, and I recommend it to anyone. Loch Crew, not too far from Navan. Creepy Meath, uh, about a, a couple of hours drive. If you get up, at, if you hit the road at five o'clock, you'll be there in time uh, to, to to see it. But anyway, these uh, me megalithic tombs start to appear with the Neolithic, and at least initially, the purpose of megalithic tombs. We, we've thought about this as archaeologists quite a lot, uh, and we've compared it with surviving megalithic cultures. There are a couple that survive uh, around the world still, and they seem to be about two things. They seem to be about emphasizing continuity and the permanence of the landscape, kind of what we have, we hold idea. We retain the right to use this landscape and we're going to demonstrate that by building something of great permanence and, and displays permanence. And the, the, the best way they could do that, and we would still do something pretty similar today, it would be to use stone, because stone is an ageless, timeless thing. And at least from a human lifetime's perspective, it's not changing. So they built, tombs in stone and, and place their ancestors into them. Uh, the other concept is probably a little bit about fertility and uh, I don't want to go into that too much because I haven't really time but there are a number of cultures around the world uh, where still uh, uh, ancestors are placed into stone tombs as a way of uh, uh, continuing, if you like, or, or 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 treating the ancestors in the right way, but also letting them become an, an anonymous group of ancestors that will guarantee the future fertility of the landscape and of the people. Uh, so anyway, getting close to the Bronze Age, which has taken me quite a while so far, uh, towards the end of the Neolithic uh, period, so we're talking after 3000 BC, from about 3000 to about 2500 BC, there's your timeline on the right hand side there, if you, left hand side, sorry, there if you want to look at it. Uh, towards the end of the deal, I think there's definitely change in the air. Uh, there is some sort of a decrease in the amount of the land, of, of the amount of land that's onto the plough. Uh, there's a huge amount of, of, of the Irish landscape is under the plough in the early and middle Neolithic, a huge amount. There have been estimations of the population. Now you can, you can sort of, to some extent, these are hard to do, the, 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 very hard to do, and there are all sorts of caveats and problems, but the idea that there are at, at the very least half a million people, and possibly as much as a million or a million and a half people in Neolithic Ireland, uh, is not at all impossible because of the numbers uh, of Neolithic settlements which have been found in recent years on excavations, on roads and uh, shopping centres and stuff like that where archaeologists have monitored uh, commercial developments. Absolutely hundreds of Neolithic settlements have been found. And when you compare it to the, the, the amount of landscape, if you like, that's been opened, it's quite clear in those projects, it's quite clear that our, our landscape is littered with Neolithic farmsteads. So there was a big Neolithic population, but in, towards the end of the Neolithic, the population seems to be dropping, at least as far as we could tell from the, the environmental record, from cores, from uh, bogs where pollen has been looked at and things like that. Uh, the landscape seems to be becoming a little less open and a little less intensively cultivated. Uh, so it may be that there's a certain amount of population uh, drop in the late Neolithic period, but that's not to say that there isn't plenty of archaeology. We start to see things like these big earthen embankments, sometimes called henge monuments, like the giant shrine outside Belfast. And then around about 2500 BC, and this is that you, you can either think of this as the last parting shot of the Neolithic or the, the, the overture, if you like, to the, to the Bronze Age, we start to see wedge tombs. And uh, wedge tombs, of course, very common in Central and West Ulster. Uh, the Sparrows is absolutely full of them. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, 
Uh, wedge tombs uh, are not really closely related at all, it seems, to earlier Neolithic tombs. They're separated by at least a gap of 500 years, and they seem to bear a, a strong resemblance to the Allée Couverte of Western France. Uh, I mean, there are, to be honest with you, there are uh, Western European Atlantic facade similarities of all the, the tombs, but some of the closest are with uh, the, the wedge tombs. They're most similar to uh, sort of, if you like, European prototypes. And around about 2500 BC, at just about the time that uh, these wedge tombs are appearing, uh, there is something else very important happening. Uh, and it's the, really the beginning of what, uh, what archaeologists call the Chalcolithic, uh, Chalcos and Lithos, uh, uh, copper, copper stone, the Copper Stone Age, if you like, the sort of the, the ha, just 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 before the Bronze Age when we still are almost in a Neolithic society, but where people are starting to use copper, the term Chalcolithic tends to be used uh, by archaeologists, and. Uh, at 2500 BC, there is a, a, a copper mine established at Ross Island, uh, down in Munster. Uh, Professor Billy O'Brien, uh, also of UCC, UCC are getting a lot tonight, a lot of calls tonight. Uh, he uh, excavated there in the mid 1990s, and he found uh, extensive uh, evidence for copper mining, uh, and. Uh, he got radiocarbon dates, which showed it to him, started production around, well, the radiocarbon dates rose exactly 2500 BC. There's always a little bit of a plus and minus in radiocarbon dating, but almost exactly 2500 BC. And production had continued at this copper mine for about five or 600 years. Uh, but what was really fascinating is now that archaeologists had a copper mine uh, where ingots of copper you know, were, 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 had been found in the immediate vicinity of it and waste from copper working, it was possible to analyze the copper in uh, British and Irish uh, copper and bronze tools and compare them to the Ross Island copper. Uh, and it was quite remarkable that, well, pretty much all Irish copper, uh, pretty much all Scottish copper and bronze as well, and about 70% of the, the, the copper and bronze tools across Britain uh, generally uh, were using uh, Irish Ross Island copper in the first five or six hundred years of the Bronze Age. So really this is the only significant, anyway, uh, copper mine that is being used in the Chalcolithic and early Bronze Age in both Ireland and Britain. And that is a, a remarkable finding of, of Billy O'Brien and some of his colleagues, Northover and others. A uh, remarkable finding and it starts to make you know, starts to make you think a lot about the nature of this period in these islands and the interrelationships uh, across Ireland and Britain at this time, and how tightly interrelated they must have been. Because, of course, copper is one thing, but there's probably the tin that's, that's supplying the, this area, Britain and Ireland, is actually coming from Cornwall. That's not entirely proven but it's very, very likely. So you, you have a, a complete interdependence across the Irish Sea for the, the, the metal industry at this period of time. Uh, this new metal using society is very different from what we've seen before. Uh, I mentioned wedge tombs. Wedge tombs are, 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 are appearing at this time and they're a little bit more like the, uh, the, 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 the earlier, if you like, in the Neolithic tradition of burial. It's communal burial. Uh, some of the, the artifacts are different. They're starting to put beaker vessels. And I'm sure some of you heard of beaker and beaker pottery, which is associated with the spread of copper. They're starting to put beaker vessels into these wedge tubes, which is suggestive of, of a different tradition. But as the Chalcolithic wears on, there's a whole new type of burial practice emerges for the first time in an Irish context, and that is individual burial. And these individual burials, what archaeologists call the single burial tradition, uh, appear about 2200 BC uh, in Ireland. Uh, when I say single, they're called the single burial tradition, about 50% of these burials are indeed single burials, and the rest are burials in very small groups. So you'll sometimes get uh, a male and female to, together of, you know, broadly similar age, sometimes maybe with an infant with them or things like that, tempting to interpret that as a family group. But what you're not seeing is the earlier uh, Neolithic practice of, of 
relatively large numbers of ancestors being placed into tombs where you find maybe dozens or potentially even hundreds of sets of human remains in stone tombs. You don't tend to find that uh, from this period onwards. Uh, you tend to find single burials in single graves. Sometimes they were placed into a wider cemetery uh, or placed into a stone cairn perhaps, but the individual burials themselves are generally the burials of either individual or a very small group of people who are probably uh, inter, uh, interrelated. Uh, next slide here. Uh, these burials uh, at the start of the, the, the well, at, 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 from, from about 2200 BC initially, for the first hundred years or so, these burials all take a very, very similar form. Uh, they, they, they typically are buried in a, a stone lined box, which is called a kist. Uh, at, 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 in this early period uh, of, the, of, of the, the Calcolithic or the beginnings of the Bronze Age, they're almost always intubation burials. In fact, they're always intubation burials. Uh, they're also always accompanied by some sort of funerary vessel. Um, an, an example of a funerary vessel here on the left-hand side, this is a burial of the funerary vessel from, from Glass of the Monkey uh, in County Dublin. Uh, and uh, you can see that the form of the, the, the vessel, it's highly decorated, it's sort of a bowl shape. Uh, these are sometimes called food vessels uh, by archaeologists, so that name is becoming a little bit less commonly used because it, it, in a sense it's misleading. We don't know for sure if there were ever food placed in these, they may, they may have had other functions. Uh, but. Uh, Sometimes called food vessels, you see that name in the literature. And occasionally other artifacts are buried in these uh, early single burial tradition burials. Sometimes flint knives, copper objects, occasionally, very occasionally, uh, buried in them. Um, and you'll see burials like this, uh, certainly in Ulster, Leinster and, uh, and Connacht. You don't see them in Munster. And you also see burials like this in Scotland as well. Uh, the, 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 the pottery form, it's, these are not beaker burials in the classic sense of a beaker burial. Some of you might know the Amesbury Archer, for instance, from the Stonehenge area, which is a burial quite similar to this, it's a, a pit with a crouched intubation and a beaker pot beside it. Uh, these are not beaker burials. The, 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 the pottery form is significantly different, but they're, they're clearly related to the beaker tradition. And in fact, uh, I think that would be my contention that it's the nature of the copper trade. One of the big copper trade routes is up from Ireland, uh, through Ireland, from Kerry, through Ireland, uh, into uh, uh, southern Scotland, and then up through into the northeast of Scotland and up the Great Glen. And some uh, uh, sort of Irish tradition of burials comes into contact with Scottish a beaker tradition, which is in the crouched intubation with the beaker pot. And the outworking of that, if you like, of that intercourse, uh, the, the product of it is, is, is the single burial tradition of, uh, of Ireland and parts of the west of Scotland uh, as well. Um, gradually, as time goes on, there are new uh, burial practices added to this uh, a relatively uh, consistent a, bur a burial practice of a crouched intubation and, and a bowl. The first thing that happens is, is that burials in kists, the stone boxes, uh, are joined by burials in pits. And also, uh, as well uh, as the, the bowls, uh, new types of, of funerary vessels with extended necks, which archaeologists describe as vases, uh, start to, 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 to be placed into these uh, burials as well. But the interesting thing about these changes, and this continues the whole way through the early Bronze Age, is that older traditions are never entirely abandoned. This is an additive, if you like, uh, set of burial rituals. New burial rituals are being added in, but old burial rituals are not, at least initially, being discarded. They continue on. So through the era, there is an increasing uh, complexity of ritual practice surrounding uh, surrounding burial through the early Bronze Age period. About 2500 BC uh, 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 come along as well, the most fundamental of which is the appearance of cremation 
in the single burial tradition in the Bronze Age burial record. Uh, cremation uh, is, 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 is interesting because, and I'll discuss this more in a minute or two, uh, because it involves major conceptual changes. Obviously, it's a huge change in ritual. Uh, but there are other changes as well. Uh, in the, the initial phase of, of the single burial tradition, uh, funerary vessels are included with all graves. But sometime around 2050, funerary vessels become an option. Not all graves have an accompanying pot. So you can start to see how things are, are, are changing. You now have a set of choices. Not everyone is buried the same way. In 2200 BC, everyone who was buried in the single burial tradition was buried the same way. They were buried in a crouched intubation in a stone box with a funerary vessel. If there was a little bit of variation, it was whether a, uh, a flint knife or something like that, or a flint spear, was placed in the grave with them. Uh, but generally, the, 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 the ritual is, is very, very, very uniform, right across almost all of Ireland, excluding a bit of Munster, and, uh, and, and the west of Scotland. But uh, as you head to about 2050, you have a lot of choices. Well, we could, we could, you can imagine the silly undertaker. <laughs> like, you know, will, 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 will we place the deceased in a pit or in a kist? You know, will, will we place a vessel with them or not? Uh, will we cremate them or will they be placed into the, the grave uh, uh, unburned? So there are a series of, of, of choices. Uh, and that choices may well reflect uh, increasing uh, increasing complexity. Until a, a number of years ago, uh, it was really, all, all of these burial practices were known, but it was not known that, that the sequence in which they occurred. It's only modern, more precise radiocarbon dates and the advances of, of what's called Bayesian statistics, which comes from the, the mathematical theories of an 18th century Church of England minister called the Reverend Bayes, uh, which has allowed uh, uh, it has allowed archaeologists to tease out these chronological subtleties and see that there's a shift from, well, not so much a shift in burial practice, but new burial practices are being added on to the original set. Uh, significant uh, cremation. Cremation is a really, really big change. Uh, and it changes, it, it's important for two reasons. The first is, is that cremation takes a lot of resources. Uh, they still, of course, have cremation in India, uh, and and and, uh, and in cremation in pyres. We have cremation here too, of course, but it tends to be gas based. But in cremation, they still, they still have cremation in, in pyres in India, and it takes about you know six hundred kilograms of, of of wood. So what's that? About fifteen hundred pounds of wood uh, to cremate an individual. That's a lot of wood. And if, if you know, you, you wouldn't need a very high population for that to start to make an, an, an impact into your managed woodland, if, 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 you, if indeed you do manage your woodland. So there's a, there's a big cost to cremation. And uh, uh, one of the things that we notice about cremation, and I say that, that uh, generally things are additive to the Irish single burial tradition, and that's, that's, that's broadly true. But one area where a new burial practice does seem to fairly rapidly supplant the old one is cremation. Incubation never disappears from Bronze Age burial, or at least not early Bronze Age burial in Ireland, but cremation does become dominant uh, fairly swiftly after its uh, in, in introduction around 2500 BC. And this probably comes down to concepts of death. Um, nowadays, of course, we have a medicalized concept of death. We imagine that death happens at the instant either the heart stops or when, when brain activity ceases, that would be a, the death certificate is signed and the time is put on it. We consider the individual to be dead at that point. In most pre-modern pre, pre societies, death was not necessarily thought to be instantaneous. Death was thought to be a process that happened over a period of time. Uh, and when, when, when the person stopped breathing or stopped moving, the quick of the dead, so to speak, uh, the, uh, the person uh, was not necessarily thought to be entirely dead. The spirit was maybe thought to be still possibly resident within them for a while or certainly close by. And the, the appropriate rituals had to be carried out to ensure that the proper migration of the, the soul or the spirit of the deceased to its final appropriate resting place. And of course, if the appropriate rights and the appropriate respect was not paid to the deceased, there were all sorts of risks inherent for the society. And it's 
it, it's clear from ethnographic studies that, in fact, in your own society, there's tremendous fear of bad luck, of not, you know, uh, executing the, 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 the wishes of the dead or not treating their body in the appropriate way. You bring bad luck and disaster possibly upon yourself, your family, hauntings, all sorts of things. So death has to be carried out in the right way. And uh, one of the, 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 the things that has been noticed in my studies and others is that uh, Bronze Age burials where there were incubations uh, were always placed into very dry soil, in fact, very sandy or gravelly soil. Uh, the suggestion is that, is that there was a, a fear of, 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 of bodies which accidentally became preserved. In other words, in other words, proper death, and this is a common uh, ethnographic motif, proper death doesn't really happen until the flesh is liberated from the bone. And it's only when, 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 the, when, when the body is decomposed that, that, that proper death can be assured. And there's no greater fear for a Bronze Age person than to open a kist to perhaps put a, 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 new, a, a, a new body into it, uh, the, 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 the wife joining the husband or whatever a number of years later, to find that the, the body of the husband was still undecomposed because there was water in the, or whatever in the bottom of the kist. So the, the idea that you can avoid all those sort of risks uh, of, of, of impartial or lengthy decomposition of, of the spirit hanging around by introducing uh, a cremation and, 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 and liberating the, 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 the body and, and the spirit instantly or instantaneously over a few hours uh, during the cremation of the funeral pyre is probably a very attractive idea to societies which might have that uh, set of beliefs. And it may well explain why a cremation largely but not exclusively supplants incubation during the early, early, early Bronze Age uh, period. Uh, another addition, and again, it doesn't completely supplant uh, earlier traditions, but another addition to Irish early Bronze Age funerary ritual starting, well, it probably starts in, initially in, in around about 2000 BC, gets up and going properly by about 1900 BC, is the burial within an urn. Now, up until this point, we've had uh, burials in, in pits and kists. We've had burials with vessels and burials without vessels. And we've had cremations and we've had intubations. But sometime around about 2000, or maybe 2050 BC, somebody takes one of the small little vases and, and, and starts packing uh, starts packing cremated bone into it. And that's observed in, in a couple of examples in the archaeological record. And then within a relatively short space of time after that, people are actually building larger vessels, vessels that are maybe 30 centimetres high uh, and large enough to take most of the or, or all of the cremated remains of an individual and starting to place the cremated remains of an individual within those. Uh, the, the, some of the dates for urns from Ireland are, are, are quite early, uh, certainly vase urns, uh, which are descendants, the, the, the first, if you like, descendants of the vases that have cremated bone packed into them, are probably appearing around about 2000 BC. That may be the first uh, use of urns for burial in Britain or Ireland. Uh, certainly the, the, the radiocarbon dates for the British vessels seem just a little bit later. But having said that, there were more Irish vessels have been uh, have probably been dated because of a couple of major research pro projects in the past 10 or 15 years. So that, that could change with it. It just takes one new research project to give some new dates and that could all change. But it seems as if the Irish ones are maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, as, as, although these uh, uh, urn burials are, are still inserted into pits and kits, kits or pits and kists, as time goes on, the, kit, the, the, the kists and the pits start to reflect the size and shape of the, the urns uh, in, in, in their morphology. Great quote from a couple of Scandinavian archaeologists, the understanding of what constitutes a grave lags behind that what constitutes a body. <coughs> uh, and you can sort of see uh, there are a couple of uh, how the kists sort of change from being big rectangular things to gradually uh, fitting around right the shape of the pot and becoming sort of subcircular uh, or 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 polygonal. Um, and this is an example of an urn under excavation. This is an encrusted urn, 
Uh, and these are, are beautifully decorated, or in switch have sort of ribs, uh, raised ribs of, of, of decoration uh, around them. I actually have it. Do I have it? So that's an example of a crusted urn. Uh, B there on the, on the bottom right hand side, you can sort of see the applied uh, decoration and some size decoration. As a vase urn uh, above it, which looks like the small uh, vase food vessels, to use that old fashioned term, sort of scaled up uh, to be able to take uh, a, a full cremation. And then the other two slightly later types of, of urn, uh, the collar urns and the cordon urns. Uh, collar urns on the bottom left, the one, the one, the sort of the uh, the, the lower one there, uh, close to the centre of the page. Uh, collar urns probably emerged in northern England uh, around about 1800 BC, maybe maybe 1900 BC, and then spread over to Ireland. Uh, the, the 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 one on the the top right hand corner, uh, the cordon urn, uh, they seem to appear around the Irish Sea Basin. Uh, in about, and around about 1800 or 18, 18, 1850 uh, BC, and uh, we're not sure where they where where they appear, but they just seem to I suppose appear everywhere about the same time. Uh, but they don't actually spread much into the west of Ireland. They tend to be around the Irish Sea, uh, Eastern Ireland, and also western parts of Britain as well. Uh, during uh, the early Bronze Age, if we split, well, I'll talk in a minute or two about splitting the Bronze Age up into different chronological phases. But we, 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 you, as, as, as we move into this uh, sort of urn burial phase, sort of like post-1900 BC, really, uh, we start to see uh, a greater profusion of grave goods uh, buried with uh, the cremated remains inside these urns. Previously, up until this point, there have been uh, vessels, uh, and there have been graves, and there have been uh, cremation or intubation of bodies. But grave goods, if you like, personal objects placed in the grave uh, with the deceased have been few and far between. And where, what they typically they have as well been relatively simple, uh, a flint knife or a flint scraper, uh, nothing more sophisticated than that. Uh, once we get into the urn burial phase, we start to see a lot more uh, sophisticated objects, expensive objects uh, placed into into burials. We start to see uh, copper daggers and copper knives, for instance. Uh, the example on the right, Grange, Craigie Ross Common, uh, an absolutely beautiful uh, uh, dagger, uh, which, which of course was 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 squished up, if you like, uh, probably to commit it to the afterlife, along with the individual in in, in the in the grave, uh, and it had a, a beautiful uh, decorated uh, panel, uh, or sorry, pommel, uh, decorated po bone pommel. I think there were bits of amber on it as well, uh, and the, the the style of the dagger is very much in the sort of Breton, uh, southwest. English or sort of Wessex culture style of, of, of dagger. So a really nice, really nice piece uh, placed into that grave. And the middle example there is of an encrusted urn. Once more, you can see the, the, the applied decorated sort of raised relief ribs uh, on it. Uh, and it, is, it, it was the burial of a child and it contains a, a little bit of worked bone, uh, which appears to be part of a whistle. And quite a lot of these uh, whistles have turned up uh, now uh, maybe uh, six, six or seven different burials across Ireland of this era. And they've always turned up in burials which have had children in them. So it's, it, I think it's reasonable to suggest they might uh, be some sort of, of, of toy. And then on the other, uh, the, the, on, the, on the left hand side there, uh, another example of, of an urn uh, with some, with, with, with a piece of decorated metalwork and also uh, Two, two, two little knives uh, from the from 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 the the fixed from the rivets on them. They may just be more knives and wink. Uh, although again, it's hard hard to hard to say with, with certainty. Uh, location is also important uh, for, for 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 many of these early Bronze Age burials. Uh, they do reuse. Uh, earlier Neolithic mounds, uh, Neolithic cairns, and insert burials into the, typically into the, the cairn. They don't so much place the burials into the interior of the tomb. So you don't get Bronze Age burials, uh, for instance, uh, uh, inserted very far into the chambers of, of, say, passage tombs and stuff like that. They had a certain amount of superstition or respect 
uh, for 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 the, the 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 current inhabitants, if you like, of those tombs. But they do typically uh, burials into the mounds above the tombs, and occasionally round the entranceway as well. So if you somewhere like the mount with the mount of the hostages at Tara, which is a passage tomb, much earlier passage tomb dating to about 3000 BC. Uh, when it was excavated, there were quite a lot of uh, Bronze Age, early Bronze Age uh, burials, quite uh, sorry, late in the early Bronze Age, this period of, that I've been discussing in the past couple of slides, 1900 BC plus, uh, inserted into the mound and inserted around the mouth of, of the tomb, and they're very opulent burials, unusually so uh, for an Irish context. And of course, they're in that particularly iconic location, Tara. Its importance was obviously then too, as it was for, for later years as well. Uh, a few things about these, uh, about the placement of, of, of early Bronze Age burials within uh, both uh, the mounds surrounding uh, older Neolithic tombs, and also sometimes within cemeteries, cemetery mounds that were built specifically to take early Bronze Age burials. Burials much more common on the east side of the mounds. Uh, you can see even from these couple of examples here, uh, the, in both cases, the mound, the, the burials are uh, distributed more towards the east than the west of the monument. It's not exclusive. It's a trend, but it's a statistically significant trend. You can probably see the example on the top right hand side there. Uh, and and, and the, there are much more burials in the east and very few in the west. And similarly, on the one on the left hand side, but, uh, there, there is sort of one sort of central burial and the rest of the burials are all on the east side of the mound. The west is, 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 is more or less uh, avoided, not exclusively avoided, but is more or less avoided. Some more populated uh, cairns, uh, early Bronze Age burial cairns, you notice that as it, as it fills up, there are more burials on the, the, the western side. So there is a chronological association too, but they definitely, the, 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 the best slots go first, the best, the, the, the best burial plots go first, and they're on the east and possibly even the southeastern uh, side of the monument. Other interesting things, at the centre of the monument, there is an overrepresentation of female burials uh, towards the centre of these mounds, uh, especially uh, the, the purpose-built early Bronze Age ones. And there are an, an, an overrepresentation of men uh, in the outer parts of, of these mounds. This bubbles just under the level of statistical significance. Uh, Sometimes identifying the sex of human remains uh, is difficult. Uh, I don't, in, my, in any of my work, I don't go by artifact types or anything like that because we, again, the common sense assumption that you know a dagger must be male and a bead must be female does not necessarily work for the past. So uh, personally, I only would use uh, the opinions of uh, human uh, anatomists or osteoarchaeologists who have examined bones and been able to positively identify them as a male or a female. Unfortunately, of course, the combination of preservation and cremation and other things means that there are a big number of indeterminate skeletons where you can't actually sex them because of one reason or another. Usually the bones are, are not well enough preserved. So uh, sometimes statistical tests are, you get, are, are, are hinting, they're getting very close to the level of statistical significance, but unfortunately, sometimes you, you can't absolutely nail it because the indeterminates are clouding uh, the picture a little. So there's an overrepresentation of females in the centre and males in the outer bits, but I can't hand and heart say it's statistically significant. Uh, interestingly, as well, burial mounds have uh, have an overrepresentation, statistically significant overrepresentation of individual burials. So although we describe this as a single burial tradition, only about half of them are actual single burials. The other half are small family groups or whatever. But people who are buried in these burial mounds are statistically more likely to be just placed in their, on their own in a burial. And that seems likely to be associated with status uh, in some way. Uh, so I'm, I've mentioned phases of the early Bronze Age, and uh, I, I, I've mentioned them without actually defining them, which is not a good thing to do. I should have had this a few slides earlier, but I kind of needed to tell the story of the, the sort of the, 
additive nature of early Bronze Age funerary ritual uh, before actually then splitting it up into to, to three chunks. But there are three fairly clear chunks of behaviour in the Irish early Bronze Age. There's the first period when there's uh, a uniformity of burial practice, more or less uniformity anyway. Kists and pits as well, admittedly, but bowls and vessels in every grave and exclusively incubation. And from the statistical analysis that I've done, very little distinction of uh, treatment of men and women and only children buried with adults. Very, very, very few children being buried on their own. Uh, the distinction between uh, men and women, the only distinction that I could really find between men and women were some, again, again, bubbling under the level of statistical significance, some differences in where uh, on the sides that men were tended to be lying on, as opposed to the sides that placed, you know, left or right side that women were placed on. Uh, some slight distinctions also in the way that the, the bodies were orientated. Uh, for instance, uh, there are no female uh, skeletons orientated with their head pointing north, but there is a group of men, male skeletons who have their heads pointed north. Uh, but these are these are distinctions that seem to be probably more to do with uh, uh, belief rather than, than, than treatment of men and women differently in death. The only treatment that I could find in phase eight to differentiate them is that although they're all placed with pots, the male pots, and again, this is statistically, it's not, it's, it's, it's not exclusive, but statistically, men's pottery vessels are likely to be more uh, highly decorated than women's. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some men who have quite plain pots and some women who have quite ornate ones. It's a statistical distinction. It's not an absolute distinction. Uh, the big change from these phase A burials, which sort of in, to, to phase B burials, is around about 2500 BC, the introduction of cremation. And cremation, as as I said, never becomes the, the only exclusive uh, burial ritual, but it does over this period of 2050 to 1950 BC, this century, does become the dominant uh, 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 ritual, the dominant, the dominant treatment uh, for human remains. Pottery is now optional, and it, it, it is statistically significant that women are less likely to have an accompanying pot. So burials without pots are more likely to be female burials. Uh, grave goods are becoming a little bit more common, uh, but they're, they're, they're still by no means the, 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 the norm, additional grave goods beyond the presence of an accompanying pot. And we see the first hints of uh, the beginning of urn burial uh, in this, this, this phase B. Phase C is really defined by the appearance of urns as being becoming during this period the dominant burial form. And also the shape of graves changes uh, to, you know, to, to, to to match after a while to match the new uh, the, the, the new ritual of placement uh, within an urn, and this is a period when grave goods become much more common and much more opulent, especially in the cordoned urns. Now, on the left hand side, I've got a really confusing uh, diagram because uh, 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 it, it's really not meant, meant, meant for this purpose, uh, but. Uh, it's, it's a radiocarbon plot, if you like, of the sums of all the different types of, uh, of, 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 of artifacts and practice during this era. So you can see the different pot types on one side, kists and pits and polygonal kists and intubations and cremations and all that sort of stuff. The, 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 the middle grey, not the light grey, but the middle grey bars are the, the most likely radiocarbon range for each of these. I've included the other colours for extreme cases, so uh, which which don't really apply to our discussion tonight. But if you look at the middle grey bars, you can see how bowls and vases and encrusted urns have, have and, and coloured urns and corn urns all have different uh, phases of use, but they mostly all actually have an era of overlapping. They all kind of overlap in practice, uh, certainly in the certain 1900, 1800 BC phase. They're all probably in use at the same time. And similarly with kists and pits, they're used through most of the era. The kists start a little earlier uh, and the pits possibly continue on uh, uh, closer to the very end of the phase, but pretty much they, they, they overlap a lot. And similarly with intubation and cremation. Uh, and, and all aspects of this, 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 this era of burial ritual, uh, whenever new styles come along, they don't entirely displace the old styles. We're seeing an increase in burial complexity throughout this era.
<clears throat> so I mentioned it way back at the start to get back to the sort of the theory of burial, uh, the, uh, the 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 mashup between uh, burial complexity, and social complexity, and the sort of economic base. So as soon as we started to have you know certain farming and started to have uh, metalworking especially, there are all sorts of opportunities for people to start to accumulate wealth, essentially. And at some stage, this is going to be reflected in uh, society. It's probably that it started to be reflected a little bit in the Neolithic. Certainly the passage tombs were getting very ornate and uh, very complex burial rituals were taking place there and that may have been a period where there was an increase in social complexity possibly proper chiefdoms with a real proper defined aristocracy emerging but the late neolithic it seems that we have some sort of agricultural sort of maybe not collapse but definitely a retrenchment uh, and it may well be that, uh, that, that, that that society that hierarchical uh, aristocratic society collapsed in some way or another, uh, allowing, I suppose, if you like, the, the, the new Bronze Age uh, uh, society to emerge. Uh, but as we, as, as we look through these three different phases, A, B and C, we can see an increase in burial complexity. And I've tried to do this a number of different ways and see if they match up. Uh, the simplest way is just to look at the number of possible combinations of burial ritual. And in that phase A, you've really only got uh, three major burial choices, if you like. There's whether you put the individual in on their own, which is potentially a, 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 an indicator of status, uh, or whether you put them uh, in, in, into, into a grave with someone else. Certainly, it, it takes a lot less effort to, to, in burial ritual, a lot less, less energy is expended to go back to that idea of tenders that I mentioned briefly at the very start, if you remember it. It takes a lot less expended energy to put someone into a pre-existing grave than it is to construct a new one. Uh, so there's a possibility that that's a sort of a status indicator, having a grave all to your own. It might be achieved rather than ascribed status, but it's not an indicator of status. And then there's the choice of a kist or a pit. Well, a kist takes a little bit more effort to construct than a pit, so there's an energy sort of component to that. And then there's the choice of burial location. Uh, if you're putting some within a cairn or a cemetery mound, uh, well, again, if the cairn has to be constructed uh, as, an, as, as, as a Bronze Age cairn, well, there's an energy component there. You're putting, putting someone into a place that needed energy uh, expended before you could uh, carry out that or a number of burial rituals. And if you're putting someone into a pre-existing uh, cairn, a Neolithic cairn, you may be sort of trying to drape them in the relics of out of decency, you know, attach them to the old regime uh, and sort of sort of, sort of, of make a status uh, statement that way. Uh, and if you're putting someone into an unmarked grave in the ground, well, that requires obviously is, 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 is less less energy. It's possibly an indication of of, of lower status than than burial in, in some sort of cairn or mound or earlier 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 tomb. So you've got three main choices for burial, and there are about nine different ways to combine those. Uh, so you've if you effectively nine different burial types in phase A of the early. So Calcolithic early Bronze Age between about 2200 and about 2050 BC. In phase B, there's a couple of extra choices have been added to your set of rituals. You can still inter the remains individually or in multiple burial. You have the choice of an inhumation or a cremation. You have the choice still of a kiss or a pit. And you've now the choice whether or not to include a pottery vessel in the grave. And that's quite an important one. I mentioned earlier that women are more likely to be buried without a, a, a vessel in the grave. Are we starting to see different treatment of the sexes? Or are we starting to see the emergence of a little bit of hierarchy, which is reflected in different ways, one of which is uh, uh, that, that, that low-status women don't get, get the, the poorest treatment, if you like, uh, but middle or high-status women are being buried with a, a pottery vessel. Uh, are we seeing something starting to open up there in, in, in status that's reflected in both terms of sex and, and, and social class? <laughs> and then there's the choice of burial location. Uh, again, whether to insert into a cairn or a cemetery mound or just simply in a, uh, a flat, unmarked grave in, in a field. Uh, there's, there's the, the extra two different choices there uh, 
mathematically give you a lot more potential choice. There are about 32 potential combinations. I've observed in the Irish Archaeological Burial Record from, I have a big database of about 600 of these graves, uh, and uh, I've observed about 24 of those possible 32 choices. So 32 theoretical ones, 24 actual ones uh, turning up in the Irish Archaeological Record, as opposed to nine, uh, if you like, individual burial combinations for phase A. So this is phase B, just that little century after phase A, big increase in the amount of burial complexity. And then in phase C, well, it's, 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 there's, a, there's a lot more. Uh, and, and it's much more difficult to quantify because some of the choices are no longer uh, binary choices. Uh, well, we're, there are at least there are several different classes of pot which you can now be buried with. And I mean, I've been up until this point, I've only been looking at pot as a binary yes or no. And I continue to do that uh, in, in my research on this uh, presence or absence of a pot was more, I thought, more important in, to, in, in terms of status and energy than the exact type of pot uh, you were buried with. But also as well, you have a whole series of choices uh, now in phase C of the type and status of grave good. Grave goods are now becoming quite common. And, uh, uh, but obviously, you, not all grave goods are the same. You can't com compare uh, a, a, a Breton style uh, uh, dagger with an, a, an, an amber and bone, in some cases, gold uh, decorated hilt or, sorry, handle on it with a simple flint scraper. The two are not equivalent uh, when they're placed into a burial. So I, I came up with a scheme for sort of uh, codifying burials according to, uh, the, again, the amount of effort that went into the, 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 the manufacture of, of, of the grave good. And I'll talk about that just briefly in a second or two. But basically it goes from, you know, sort of like a little bit of sharp stone up to a really fancy piece of copper or wonderful jewellery uh, in four, four sort of different statuses. Um, when, when, when you look at all of the, the, the com complex choices in, in phase C, there really are about 64 different combinations of them. Uh, and and, and I, I, I can't remember the figure off the top of my head, but I think it's like 46 or 48 have, have been observed in the archaeological record. So again, a big step up in potential complexity uh, from, uh, from, from, from that intermediate phase B. So in the period, if you like, after uh, 1950, from 1950 to 600 BC, or sorry, 1600 BC, we see a big increase in, in burial complexity. And I'm not, I'm not going to talk too much about grave good status, but you know, the lowest status is no grave good. Uh, and then an, unimpro an unimproved sort of like commonplace uh, item, like an, a, a, a just a, a barely struck flint flake. Still good tool, sharp edge, but nothing more than that. And then maybe a, a step up from that status is a well-defined artifact, skillfully made. You know, it required a bit of craft, like a retouched scraper or knife or a single stone bead or maybe a simple bone pin. And then the most complex items are, are, are objects that are either very difficult to manufacture, which have, which have uh, uh, rare uh, raw materials, or both. So bronze objects, complex jewellery, beautifully crafted bone pins, that sort of thing come into that sort of category. So the burial attribute contributions going from 9 to a theoretical uh, 32 to a theoretical 64 uh, and, 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 and observed as well increase in complexity of itself does suggest that we're seeing more complex burial ritual and this is probably uh, in, in, indicative of, 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 of a more complex society uh, that's becoming established, a uh, chieftain-based society uh, during this period uh, of time. Uh, I did another couple of ways to try and look at it. Uh, one of the ways I looked at was cluster analysis. Again, this is quite complex. But cluster analysis, uh, well, I'm sure somebody's probably know all about it, but uh, it's cluster analysis statistical technique for trying to See the see the see the wood for the trees, so to speak, by grouping like with like, and you can you can then take your clusters. You can start to look at the individual members of the clusters, and see what things they correspond to in the rest of the burial ritual, and <clears throat> essentially did that for each of the three phases that the radiocarbon sort of sorted out for us. Three phases of burial ritual, and the first phase. 
you notice that actually the the again using a sort of a, a status calculation similar to the status calculation carried out for grave goods that the, the clusters of burials which seem to have the most status the ones which are individual burials placed into cairns for instance in well-defined pits in phase a strangely enough the two highest clusters are both burials of older children and that's not something which you would expect in a chiefdom society and it's actually it's not even something that would be uh, typical of a, 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 a of a tribal or a band society uh, and initially I was a wee bit perplexed but I, I, I read about a number of ethnographic cases which are, are discussed in the anthropological record where in fact in tribal societies on occasion uh, where, when, 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 when in tribal societies which do not have a, a stratified or a very well defined hierarchy uh, sometimes uh, it's not very important to be too prescriptive about burial practice in certain cases, and one of the one of the occasions which it's acceptable uh, to move outside typical, if you like, uh, burial practice. In other words, uh, uh, behave uh, not reflect the achieved achieved status of individuals is in cases where emotion is very important, and the, the burial of older children and adolescents. Is marked out uh, as, as, as being uh, as being uh, situations in which the emotional loss, the, the bereavement uh, of losing the individual, allows them effectively to leapfrog in burial terms the usual sort of status hierarchy. Uh, and in, 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 in this one particular type of society, where uh, rank is, is 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 achieved, where it's not uh, ascribed. Uh, by family lineage, uh, you can you can you can effectively leap a sort of a, a graded status if you're an older child who has died in a tragic way. So what you're really seeing there is a combination of emotion and what some sort of anthropologists would say is lost lost work and reproductory potential for the society. I think that's a bit a bit cold, but I suppose it's a, a way of evaluating it uh, numerically. Uh, as you move into the sort of the, 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 the phase B period where we're sort of seeing a bit more complexity uh, uh, in, 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 in funerary behaviour, it's quite interesting that mature adults are now uh, the people who are represented in the highest status cluster, uh, with ad adolescents and older children being represented in the second highest status cluster. This is, I think, very indicative of the type of Plains Indian again, where you're getting a really complex society, which is just on the cusp of being a proper chieftain, where there are people who are uh, who are held up as, as as paragons of virtue and influence and leadership, uh, and it's based upon their, their their personal prowess. And what we're seeing here is the highest class of burial in that society being mature adults who are males. Uh, people who have in, 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 in the beginnings of a patriarchal society who are beginning to who, who, are, who are achieving their status through life but where the society has become co so complex that there are clear well-defined offices uh, for them to, uh, to, to, to to fit into once they achieve that degree of status so it's not just a, a simple a simple tribe this is a complex tribe that's on the cusp of, of, of mutating into something else, but it hasn't done so. And of course, uh, they're, they're, society can maintain status, uh, sorry, can maintain stasis, uh, can, can, can be static sometimes for quite long periods of time, unless there are challenges, environmental or resource challenges or invasions or other things, migrations, to sort of, to sort of upset uh, the, the, the stable system can maintain this sort of, uh, sort of type of behavior for potentially uh, a very, very long uh, period of time. So this is a, a complex tribal society with a lot of specialization and well-defined offices of leadership and importance, but where it's still not uh, leadership and importance based on familial uh, background. But in phase C, we start to see something very, very different indeed. Uh, and uh, the first thing is, well, with 64 potential different groups, uh, even with cluster analysis, it, 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 it reduced that to about 13 uh, different uh, clusters. Uh, the mathematical coefficient, which, which, which it, uh, the, the statistical analysis, cluster analysis, uh, 
gave with that that was very very high for for cohesion which suggests that from a mathematical point of view this is a meaningful uh, clustering uh, as, as the others had a high cohesion figure too but this was particularly high and when you do look along the groups there, there are some very very interesting associations if you remember back to peoples and costs peoples and costs said that there really should be three broad classes they believed there'd be an underclass uh, and then an elite class, so at the very top, what they describe as an apical class uh, of really, really high status burials, uh, which they said should be exclusively male, uh, not just mostly male, but exclusively male, and 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 uh, quantifiably different from 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 the others. And what you notice here with this cluster six at the very top is that there's no representation of males. Uh, there's an underrepresentation, no, no children at all actually, it, it, it's, uh, it says an underrepresentation of children, there C minus, which is a non-statistically significant underrepresentation, but it's not statistically significant because the cluster is relatively small, it's not because there are a couple of children in there, there are none, so it's, it's overwhelmingly male and overwhelmingly and, and completely adult, and this is, the, these, these burials mostly have copper within them, uh, copper and, and, and objects of, of, of jewellery, uh, beads, and bone, decorated bone pins and things like that. Uh, in the couple of classes below that, there, uh, there, there are uh, plenty of uh, female burials, such as number nine, which is still quite high status, has an overrepresentation of females, again burials in urns, uh, and uh, you also get children in cluster 13, there's an overrepresentation of older children. Uh, so what, what, what basically, uh, to cut a long story short, what you're seeing here, and it would take quite a while to go down through all 13 clusters, but I'll, I'll mention it in the next, uh, the next slide, you, you, you see, you're starting to see the spread of uh, three different basic social groups. In the lowest social group, uh, you have uh, lots of children in multiple burials. Uh, they're not typically buried on their own. In the middle social group, you see women and children being treated better than the women and children, and get, in other words, put in higher status burials than the women and children. In the lowest subordinate supergroup, and the apical class at the very top, you have an exclusively male, uh, exclusively adult uh, burials placed into, uh, into cairns, uh, with 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 high status grave goods associated with them. I just want to point out cluster eight there doesn't seem to fit. It's quite a big cluster. It doesn't work very well. It's the one that sticks out from the rest is not working very well. And um, these are a, a series of uh, burials of cremations, adults and children. Slight over representation of males, but not statistically significant. And they're 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 very very. They're all found actually basically. Uh, in kiss, in, sorry, inserted into cairns, uh, and uh, I think that these actually might be later. Very few of these have radiocarbon dates. They're generally just little scrapes of a s small amounts of cremated bone pressed into tiny little pits and gullies and pre-existing cairns. And I actually think these are later Bronze Age burials. But uh, they, they, they made their way into my uh, database by association and because I had nothing to demonstrate for sure that they weren't, they weren't later. But I actually think if I was to get a grant funding to look at the, the dating of some of these, I think they'd come out post-1600 BC in the later Bronze Age. This was part of a slightly different uh, burial tradition. The other thing, of course, is the writing pyramid that anthropologists talk about, where you can sort of see it whatever way you slice it and dice it. Uh, there are there, there 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 seems to be a decreasing uh, number of burials as as status in, increases. So uh, to try to summarise what I said so far, uh, really there is a single burial tradition appears about twenty two hundred BC, and it, it it gradually over the next few centuries accrues new uh, new, new elements and becomes a lot more uh, sophisticated. Uh, becomes a lot more complex, and that seems to uh, be, 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 be reflecting uh, an increasing sophistication, an increasing complexity, and then possibly in phase C, the emergence of something that looks very like uh, a proper aristocratic based uh, chiefdom. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the origins of this society. I've mentioned Ross Island already, uh, I've mentioned Beaker Pottery. 
Uh, but recent studies, uh, you've probably heard so of some of them. Uh, Laura Cassidy from uh, Trinity College Dublin, the, the, the Smurfit Institute of Genetics, uh, run by, 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 by uh, Dan Bradley, uh, Maharaman, uh, uh, who, who, is, who leads that research team, Professor Dan Bradley, and uh, they have looked at uh, the, the, the DNA evidence, essentially, of the Irish Neolithic and Early Bronze Age. It's fascinating and it's revolutionary. And now other studies, well, they're following up in Ireland with new studies, and other studies are replicating their work around Europe as well. Uh, and uh, uh, what's really interesting about it is, is that it suggests a number of things. One, it backs up what I said earlier about uh, the, the Neolithic being a migration. Uh, the, the Neolithic farmers who arrive in Ireland uh, have DNA which is similar to other European farmers of the emergent Neolithic and that DNA has a big element of Near Eastern or Southeast European DNA because of course that was the Fertile Crescent where farming first emerged and spread north and west through Europe. So if you look on the left hand side of the screen there's a little green square Ballynahatty. That's DNA from a passage tomb in Ballynahatty. And although the, the, the sort of bright coloured squares that are surrounding it are Neolithic burials from all around Europe, behind it, there's in the little circles, are modern population groups. And you'll actually see that they're closer to, in modern population terms, to sort of Sardinia and southwest Mediter southeast Mediterranean uh, than they are to modern Western Europe. And that's quite interesting. And that's true for most actually Neolithic uh, uh, burials there. Quite similar to southwest, southwest European, uh, southwest Mediterranean, uh, sort of modern DNA, and that probably reflects the spread of of, of farming uh, across Europe. Then uh, Bradley and Laura Cassidy and their their team looked at some burials from the Irish Bronze Age, and they started off with burials from Rathlin, but they've replicated this now with other burials, so they're not published yet. Uh, but uh, I'm told that they're, 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 the results are coming out broadly similar. But they looked at uh, the burials from three classic Bronze Age uh, kists of about 2100 BC or thereabouts from Rathlin Island. Uh, and they did the DNA on them. And the first thing is, is that they're much more like Western European DNA uh, as it is now. A little bit of evidence, a wee bit similar to modern uh, Eastern European DNA too. Interestingly, a lot of a lot of things that are currently sort of quite common in the Irish population, like uh, like cystic fibrosis and hemochroma. What do you call that disease? That uh, iron iron disease and blood hemochromocytosis or something like that. Yeah, hemochromatosis. That's it. Uh, uh, they they had the DNA for that, so they probably were suffering from that. And uh, they, they said that generally, the study said that generally they were pretty close to what they considered in the modern Irish Scots uh, phenotype or genotype rather. Uh, sort of very much the contemporary populations in Ireland or Scotland uh, around about 2100 BC. They did have uh, quite a lot of evidence of uh, ancestry from uh, basically what would be the steppes, the Yamna culture of the steppes. They had elements of Yamna DNA in them and the Yamna are thought of as one of the groups that probably contribute to the whole bigger thing of moving populations uh, bringing beaker uh, across, sorry, bringing beaker and bringing copper to Western Europe. So, in a sense, it's it's not unexpected, but it was unexpected. Uh, the other interesting thing from that study is that there's not much evidence of survival, at least on the male side, of the DNA of the ancient Neolithic farmers and modern uh, DNA of the bulk of the population. In, in, in Ireland or, or Scotland. Uh, it seems as if, at least on the male side, their DNA did not continue. Now, why is that? Was that had the, you know, was, was the Neolithic community be that stage after maybe failing agriculture for a few hundred years quite small and it swamped to be a larger Bronze Age population or copper using population, so we don't see their DNA very much? Or were, 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 were they forbid from mixing and did they gradually die out? Or did the, 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 the copper users 
take wives from the, uh, maybe euphemistic term, from the, the Neolithic uh, community, but not allow the, the, the men to continue their uh, bloodlines, so to speak, uh, or a combination of all those, or some other process. Uh, we don't know. Unfortunately, it's harder to look, uh, I'm told, at female DNA continuance because there's less, it's, it, there's, there's more patterning in the male DNA than for want of a better word, I'm not a huge DNA expert, uh, and therefore it's easier to, to, to spot threads and lines, whereas in the, the ex-DNA it's broader groups, and it's harder because they would have, uh, being broadly sort of like sort of uh, Eurasian, they would have had the similar sort of in both communities, similar uh, 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 matrilineal DNA anyway, so it would be more difficult to, to spot distinctions between them. This is just a map to show that uh, the black uh, bit in this map shows evidence of step DNA in Bronze Age populations across Europe from a new study uh, being done by Olald. And I'm told also that more recent studies are showing that actually northern Spain is quite a lot of that black wedge too. So that's, that's step DNA starting to show up. The same sort of stuff that's showing up in Ireland uh, as, as a major component of the Irish Copper Age and Bronze Age uh, DNA. Uh, so uh, a wee bit of, a, of kite flying here. Uh, uh, I mentioned it already. Well, I sort of already mentioned this, to be honest with you. I think that the, the origins of the, 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 the single barrel tradition in Ireland probably emerges from uh, copper use. Uh, there are some, uh, I mean, some, some striking similarities in the archaeology of, say, Pistic Northeast Scotland. Uh, in the Bronze Age and say Ireland. We've talked about Munster quite a lot. Munster is the place where all the copper's coming from. If you go up to uh, northeast Scotland and you look at their stone circles, they have very distinctive stone circles up there. They have uh, stone circles which have uh, pillar stones flanking the entrance of the stone circles and then at the opposite end of the stone circle they have a recumbent slab stone uh, that lies flat on, on, on the ground, if you like, rather than sticking upwards. If you go down to Munster, you see almost exactly the same uh, types of stone circles. Uh, if you look at the copper of northeast Scotland's uh, uh, Migdale Marnock, a very profuse uh, copper axe making tradition up there, the copper that's used in a couple of copper and bronze axe making tradition, the copper that's used is 100% Irish copper. It's been brought uh, to, 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 to Scotland uh, by traders, presumably middle, middle, middle traders in between the primary copper producers and uh, the, the copper smiths and the Migdale Marnock tradition. They're probably presumably copper traders who are plying their shoot up through Ireland across the North Channel into, into uh, uh, the Great Plain and up into northeast Scotland. Is it, is it, I mean, it's, it's probably not the same traders going the whole way. Probably there's changes hands several times on the way. But certainly there are lots of interactions and lots of intercourse around these areas. And, and I think that uh, that, uh, that, 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 that the essence of the Irish single burial tradition is, is born in that sort of North Channel sort of intercourse. A really interesting burial there in the top right hand side uh, is a classic Beaker burial from Scotland. Now, I've mentioned Beaker several times up until now. That's an example of a Beaker. You can see it superficially looks like a stretched up version of the Irish food vessel. Uh, they're a bit earlier in the Irish food vessel. There are Beakers from about 2500 BC. And uh, this is a classic Beaker burial of about 2200 BC, maybe 2150 BC, uh, near Inverness, called Duffel, near Inverness, that was found a few years ago. Uh, interestingly, I think there was evidence for meat at the bottom of the, the beaker, so we know what they were doing with it. Uh, hopefully it was going to be Saturday night. But uh, the, uh, the, the, the really interesting thing about this burial is that the, the, the individual who was buried, uh, the isotopic uh, uh, remains of his teeth were analysed, and isotopes from teeth are wonderful because they can sort of tell you where you spent the formative years of your life, where you grew up, because the isotopes in the, in the groundwater become trapped in the enamel of your teeth. And basically, he was from Northeast Ireland, so uh, possibly County Antrim, but certainly Eastern Ulster somewhere. And this guy was living uh, or working or trading uh, over in Inverness or married over in Inverness. He was using copper. 
uh, and uh, he was he, he he died, and he was buried in Inverness. And he was buried in a classic Scottish speaker tradition. So you have there the 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 the, the backdrop, if you like, of 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 mer the potential backdrop there for the merging of traditions that is 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 allowing the single burial tradition, which looks quite a lot like the the bigger tradition crouched in the incubations with an accompanied vessel in a pit or a kist. It looks pretty similar. It is pretty similar, and it is probably this sort of intercourse of of of, of worldless meeting that's, that's facilitating this. Uh, the other thing, of course, is then that's the beginning of the single burial tradition about 2200, 2150 BC. But what then about the big change? And um, the, the, there is this big change around 1900 BC, and you don't just see it in Ireland; you also see it in Britain. Uh, there is the emergence of some sort of, of, of elite uh, represented by elite burial. These are some of the dagger burials scattered across Ireland. Uh, and you, you some of these, these, these uh, are, are the, the, the class three daggers are a beautiful type of Breton influenced uh, dagger, uh, sometimes called Armorico British type daggers. Uh, this is, this is, the, this is the, the, what you call it, the iPhone 12 of the what's the current iPhone? This is the big status symbol of the of, of the early Bronze Age. One of these daggers, and of course, a dagger, unlike unlike a knife, a dagger is not a, a tool. A dagger is a weapon, and uh, just like swords are weapons, and they're personal weapons. And people have always fought. People have always had violence, but up until a certain point in time, around the early Bronze Age. Vi you know, violence weapons were tools that were pressed to the use as weapons. So the other thing people fought with arrows and they fought with axes. Uh, but they also used axes for, for, for cutting down trees and they used arrows for hunting. Uh, but in the Bronze Age, we see the first proper weapons and that's indicative of something. And that's indicative of, emer of the emergence of a class who need to secure their power through having either access uh, or a monopoly on weapons themselves or controlling another group who fight for them. So daggers themselves are an indication of status and combined with the other indications of status of location of burial and type of burial, I think we do see the emergence of a proper aristocratic elite in the years after 1900 BC. But as I say, it's really interesting that we also see this in Yorkshire and we also see it in Wessex at around and about the same time. So some of you may have be aware of Bush Barrow, the, the really beautiful uh, sort of a, uh, dagger and mace and a gold lozenge uh, on, on, on the chest of the, the, the Bush Barrow a burial of about 1900 BC uh, in Salisbury Plain. Uh, we have a couple of probably similar burials in Ireland. Unfortunately, they were dug up by 19th century antiquarians and uh, no remains of them uh, survive. And the, 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 the reports which were, 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 were made at the time were, were scant to say the least. Uh, but one little copper, one little golden plaque of a, of, of, of a coat made of golden plaques in which a body was found of about 20 of about 1900 BC uh, survives in, in, in the, the, the Dublin Museum uh, uh, and uh, to, to, to demonstrate that there were some similar opulent burials happening very very opulent burials happening at the same time so what could be what, what could be happening to, 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 to provoke this uh, change in societal structure because as I mentioned earlier the sort of plains type Indians uh, com complex tribal society but not quite stratified hierarchy could continue for centuries or potentially even millennia if there was nothing to intervene and I think that the, 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 the spike or the, the poke that causes change is uh, the, the decline of the Ross Island uh, uh, I have mine uh, between 2000 and BC. Simply put, there is a copper crisis in Britain and Ireland caused by the extinction of the the, 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 the ore, the copper ore in this mine in that period. Uh, there are no other sources of uh, copper coming into use for at least a couple of hundred years uh, after 1900 BC. There are a few mines start production in Wales, probably between 16 and 1700 BC. There might similarly be a couple of new mines start production, maybe 14, 1500 BC in Munster as well, as new uh, 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 and start to be a sort of a crisis. 
which is not that copper stops being used, but recycling of copper becomes tremendously important. And the emphasis switches from the miner, and of course there was only one mine in Ireland, presumably controlled by one group of people who were spreading their wealth, if you like, through the landscape, but it moves from the miners who now have no power to the people who control or well, either the, 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 the copper makers, the smiths themselves, or the people who are bold enough to control the smiths and make the smiths work for them. So presumably a, a fairly uh, aggressive group of either smiths or people who decide to control the recycling trade in copper uh, around about 1900 BC emerges and with time they become an established uh, aristocracy and get trappings and wealth with them which define them uh, from other people. Uh, and this, as I mentioned, to ready, ready this slide, uh, the, the, the interdependence of Britain and Ireland in copper and in tin mean that these effects of the, the, the Ross Island mining will not have been limited just to Ireland or, or, or Munster. They will have been across uh, Britain and Ireland. And it's not such a surprise that the reaction should be similar in Britain and Ireland uh, to this crisis. They probably have a similar enough society before that anyway. They have been both influenced by at least large-scale migrations, if not you know, large-scale population replacement possibly, in the Calcolithic and Early Bronze Age up to that point. We know that from the DNA. And they're in close contact because they're copper users and they're trading copper. And the other thing is, of course, there's a a well-established archaeological principle which goes by the wonderful name peer polity interaction but it basically means wherever you get a couple of kingdoms or lineages well established in an area they will compete with each other but they'll compete through a process of emulation so you think of the cold war you know sort of the, the missile gap and the space project and all that sort of things where when superpowers want to compete they have to find a common playing field to compete on, to compete on the same things. They can't do their own thing, or they're not really competing. So you get this pure polity interaction, this, to use the technical term, that's happening uh, uh, that's happening in uh, early Bronze Age uh, Ireland and Britain at the same time. And they start to have tribal societies moving into complex chiefdoms at about the same time and in the same manner, and using the same symbols of power, uh, gold, uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, exclusive burials in certain locations, uh, opulent burials with weapons like daggers, very fine crafted objects. Uh, so it says conclusions, but I'm actually going to run on just a little bit if you don't mind. Tell me if it's too late. But I might run on for five minutes more than give you a chance. Any is that haven't fallen asleep to ask a question or two, but. Uh, uh, so in this period of time, uh, in conclusion, metalworking appears about 2500 BC, traded by Irish uh, traders uh, into Scotland, uh, close contact with the beaker tradition in Scotland, and they sort of bring that beaker tradition changed a little bit but back into Ireland through, well, what anthropologists call counter-stream migration, uh, if you like. Uh, this was initially a tribal society. It probably becomes quite a complex tribal society with lots of offices that people can aspire to uh, if they work their way up through the ranks, if you like. Uh, but it's not a, it's a, it's a career open to talent, if you know what I mean. It's merit, meritocratic as opposed to aristocratic. But there is some sort of a crisis caused probably by the decline of the Ross Island mine and the, the absence of new copper, uh, which destroys presumably the power of the the copper miners and the copper traders around 1900 BC and gives power to those people who can recycle copper, in other words take old copper and make new copper objects out of it. Whether it's the copper smiths themselves who become powerful or maybe more likely it's a group of bully boys who know how to twist the arm of the copper smiths and make them do their bidding in a number of different locations around Ireland and Britain. Uh, it's, 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 it's hard to say but certainly uh, an, an aristocracy who control copper emerge at this period of time. Uh, I mentioned earlier that there are some uh, chiefdoms, early chiefdoms just control a little bit of the economy, and I think that's the case with, with this. 
they probably control uh, the copper trade and they have a monopoly on violence. I would imagine they will restrict very much to certain classes, things like daggers and other weaponry, swords and things start to emerge in this period of time as well. But they are, they are not what's sometimes called a totalizing chieftain in that the, to, to hold land or to, uh, you know, to mine flint or stuff like that, you don't necessarily need the, the permission of the king or the chief. Uh, you could do that okay. You have your traditional lands, your traditional family lands and stuff like that. But certain parts of the economy and certain activities are locked out to those who aren't uh, part of the uh, elite. And, and as I say, I think this, this happens not just in Ireland, but it happens in, in Britain too. Just a couple other slides here I've grabbed from another lecture uh, which I had on my computer just to tell you what happens in the next few hundred years. Uh, post 1500 BC we start to see the, a lot more evidence of the Bronze Age. In the early Bronze Age settlements still aren't that common, most of our knowledge comes from graves. Uh, metalwork becomes even more sophisticated in the late Bronze Age and really interestingly burials become simpler and harder to detect archaeologically. Uh, they're, they're, they're found in quite large numbers, but they're not found by accident, by people plowing in fields. They tend to be found by formal archaeological excavations. The burial ritual becomes a very, very simple cremation without grave goods, without vessel, just placed in the pit. This is not happening because society has suddenly uh, collapsed. This is a period, the period from 1500 BC to about 800 BC, where we see lots of evidence for settlement, lots of evidence for wealthy metal work, lots of evidence for increased levels of agriculture, so what this is, this is a growing and emerging society. Uh, so it's not a collapse in, 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 in social complexity. And this is, seems to be a deliberate ideological masking in the way that Mike Parker Pearson talked earlier on of, of, of status and burial. It's as if it's become a bit gauche to express your status and burial. And at the same time that simpler burial seems to become more fashionable, there are a couple of other parallel processes which may be related to it. Uh, the first thing is, is the deposition in bogs of high status metalwork, the sort of stuff that was being placed in graves, uh, not just in Ireland but across Europe, starts to be placed in bogs, which is very interesting. Uh, so it suggests it possibly that uh, instead of, of, of depositing your, 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 your dagger and then later on your sword in the grave, people are, are taking things and placing them in water, watery places where they can get access to the underworld that way. So a, maybe a different sort of tradition that's related to burial, but not exactly the same. But the other thing that happens is really interesting is the beginning of, of, of the paraphernalia of feasting. This is the period where bronze, huge bronze cauldrons uh, tend to be found, and a lot of them have been found in, in, in the bogs of, of Ulster, of course. Uh, I had a great uncle who found one when digging turf, many, it must have been the 1930s, uh, and uh, quite commonly found, or have been in the past. And these and other associated uh, paraphernalia, like flesh hooks and stuff like that that are found, uh, are probably indications of some sort of a feasting culture. And the idea the, of feasting cultures generally, it's a bit like the idea of the big tent, you know, you might be a poor farmer, you might be the king, but you're in the tent with the king, you're part of the gang, and okay, you're not going to get the finest cut of the meat off the pig, but you'll get a bit of the pig, you'll get, you'll get to stick your flesh hook into the cauldron and pull out a uh, a lump of meat too, although the, 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 the king and then the champions will get their portions first. So it's a way of, of, of smoothing over uh, tensions caused by an increasingly uh, stratified society with a bigger gulf between rich and poor, this sort of feasting institution. And hand in hand with that, it might be that, that, that uh, simplicity and burial as a, an aesthetic is creeping in this kind of a way of saying, well, you can't take it with you, you know, we're all the same in death, we're all in this together, as David Cameron famously said after the big bank crash of 10 years ago, uh, the same sort of uh, uh, ideas being used to smooth over inequality by making everybody feel a part of something bigger. Uh, just other things that are happening this period of time, you start to see the first proper villages. Some of you may know this from Port Rush, Coarse Town, uh, excavated in 2002, published by Vicky Ginn, Stuart Rathbone, uh, a number of years ago. Uh, this was uh, 70 houses 
we'll still have a bit of an embryonic street grid. Uh, this was found during the housing development. Interestingly, on all the sides around it, uh, the housing development, there were housing developments on all four sides, and it's quite possible that there were more than 70 houses that this extended out of the area uh, and was part of a, a larger village. Uh, interestingly, all the houses are about the same size. There doesn't seem to be any social differentiation, if you like, between the houses. Uh, although we know from other ways that this is a period where there is great opulence, hill forts, uh, fantastic metalworking. Uh, so it's 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 likely that there are some higher status uh, dwellings somewhere else in this area that are outside the the, the, the area of the excavation, probably under some of the the 1970s houses which were, were built around it. I mentioned hill forts there a second ago, around about 1100 BC, maybe a little bit before. Big hill forts start to be built in Ireland or Scotland. This is an old slide, uh, and uh, I, I'll admit, and. Uh, this has been rethought about England and Middle East Europe. Uh, that uh, that the Irish and Scottish hill forts are earlier. We used to have a bit of pride in saying that, but I think actually there's evidence turning up that the the gap is shrinking. Uh, you can see the way these hill forts are made here in these slides. Uh, if, you, if you see my mouse, uh, you probably see this is Lurig Athen uh, above uh, above Christian Doll. You probably see that the double line there. Those are ramparts cutting off a peninsula of land. Uh, so it effectively means that you know you can't three three sides. You, you, it's very very difficult to to climb up there. In fact, damn nearly impossible. And from the side where you can climb up, you have to pass through these ramparts if you want to get into the, the citadel. And there are hot sites visible from aerial photographs here. And this is the one below is not do, which my uh, friend and colleague, uh, former colleague in Queens, Philip McDonald, excavated oh, with the time team. I think 2009, published a few years ago in the Ulster Journal of Archaeology, and there also it's a, it's my mouse gone, it's a, it's a peninsula with a, two very well-defined ramparts. Um, you can actually see some of the house platforms there, if you just look, I think, with where my mouse is. And he excavated several house platforms and dated, dated well, three of them anyway, to about 1100 BC, 1200 BC, and the fourth one had an odd date, it was actually very early. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. Sometimes these things just happen. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, sometimes people have called this a golden age. This is some of the sophisticated metalwork that you're getting as you move into the middle and late Bronze Age. Uh, proper swords, uh, the sort of types that you see in comic books, really, you know. Uh, and uh, big bronze cauldrons. I mentioned the significance of bronze cauldrons, bronze cauldrons and fabulous gold jewellery. Uh, in this period of time. Again, a lot of it being deposited in bogs and watery places, which is uh, uh, is uh, uh, an inkling into some of the ritual practices that are being carried out. Uh, needless to say, hundreds of pages, thousands of pages written about these ritual practices, but it's sometimes hard to put your hand in your heart and, and say for sure what you think's going on. A lot of it has to be by necessity speculation. And then around about 800 BC, I'm not really going to go much beyond this, uh, a few few things happen. First thing, well, about 850, but well, uh, earliest iron uh, I'm not going to put a name on it because uh, it changes all the time, but it's probably around about 800 BC, the first iron starts to be used. Uh, and this iron initially uh, takes the form of iron versions of earlier copper objects, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very much iron working in the Bronze Age uh, milieu. Society seems to stay the same, but then something happens at about 800 BC. Uh, I mentioned the gap in the Neolithic. Uh, the gap in the at the at the end of the Bronze Age is is is, is much more profound and deep than the gap at the end of the Neolithic. It's not to say that there's nothing for 500 years. It's probably a bit of an exaggeration, but there's very little evidence for anything for 500 years. Uh, uh, why is a very good question. And I'm actually working on this at present, this problem, with a colleague of mine. Uh, sorry, somebody must think. I'm gonna, <laughs> somebody must think I'm finished. <laughs> uh, maybe we're all for a bit longer to say it. <laughs> uh, uh, why is there this gap for several hundred years? Political collapse, the value of copper again dropping because of the adoption of iron is a possibility, disturbing uh, established uh, aristocratic lineages, causing some sort of social collapse, environmental problems, there certainly are problems with uh, 
uh, the environment, there's increasing rainfall, there is definitely a reduction in agricultural production that never ceases, uh, but we're, they're definitely entering a cold and damp period. But you see a, a drop in, in parts of Britain as well, but it's not as profound as the drop in in, in, in evidence for uh, archaeological activity, shall we say, as there is in Ireland. Uh, I say a colleague of mine, a colleague of me, are working on this at present, um, sort of throwing together ideas and radio carbon dates and stuff like that. We're trying to write something about it at present, but well, he's been trying to write about it for the past 25 years. And <laughs> I'm coming later to the, the party. Uh, uh, we'll see, see, see how we go on. We've some theories about uh, migration outwards from Ireland into Western Britain, and then probably migration backwards a little later in the Iron Age, bringing new uh, new artistic styles like Latin and things like that. Uh, I, most archaeologists don't terribly like to use the word Celts as an, an ethnic marker for a group of people. I don't think we see a lot of evidence for it. And the DNA would suggest that the last huge migration to uh, Ireland was Bronze Age. Uh, there are later migrations, of course. Normans and Vikings and all cross uh, our paths at different times, but they're all within, they're all not that far away from the basic Irish Scots genotype, if you know what I mean. Uh, so they're, 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 they're what you would call it, they're, 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 they're not making that huge contribution uh, of difference. Uh, but the last big, big, big uh, important migration was, 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 was Bronze Age. And we don't see much evidence either archaeologically or DNA-wise for Celts, for, for want of a better word, uh, coming to Ireland. And I think, or for that matter, Britain, and I think that most archaeologists would now relegate the term Celtic to be one to be used when talking about linguistics and language. Uh, maybe the, rather than one used as an ethnic marker or uh, with an idea of a great Celtic empire or Celtic migrations in the Iron Age, because simply the evidence doesn't seem to be there. So listen, I've gone on for a long time. Um, you're probably all uh, half asleep or gasping for a cup of tea or something like that. If, if, if you're game, I'm happy to stay and take a few questions. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll shrink off the... I'll stop sharing the slides, maybe. I'll see if there are any of you out there. <laughs> yes, we're still here, Carmen. <laughs> we're not all asleep yet. Great. <laughs> well, here, I'll tell you what it is. Thank you very much for coming on there. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, you stayed on a lot longer than I thought you were going to be, and we're still yeah, here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wish you, you were my next year for I could listen to you all night, to be honest with you, you know. And, um, I think if I started to ask you these questions, you'd be on for another couple of hours. <laughs> and I know we've got school in the morning and all the rest, so I think we'd be better just to stop it there. Oh, um, right, fair enough. When, when I put it on, uh, trans when the inputs on Transnatera and the Valley Area Ancestry, the wee video, people can ask the questions in there, you know, and I'll tell you. Absolutely. No drop me an e if anybody's interested in anything, drop me an email, you know. Uh, uh, or any if they want no, uh, information about any of the sites or anything like that, how to get to them. Um, I only mentioned a few sites, but I'd be you know, delighted to, 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 to answer any questions anybody has. Yeah, I've been I've been up the Lotus sites up in Donegal over the last couple of weeks, and uh -huh. this area is amazing. Hey? You know, you've, got, you've got so so many cairns and health force all over this place. Just behind them, you know. I, I mean, I, 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 I love it. I love it up there. You know what I really, you know what I really want to do. I want, I, I want to put a chance to date the giant scots. <laughs> Have you this bit here? Well, yeah. No, I, I don't actually. I don't. I, I know. I've, I've seen it. Yes, I must actually get a copy of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you should. It's, it's un, unreal what by Tom Forwins has done. It's not. That's not actually his name. We probably. I'd, we were trying to find his real name. He's, I don't know no, I've, I've seen a couple of copies. I must, I must, I must actually uh, go. I'll, I'll have to go online. It's, 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 it's uh, I don't know if it's maybe on Amazon. I don't know bookshops. I haven't been in a bookshop so long. <laughs> but uh, I want to thank you very much for coming on. Hey, it was a fascinating lecture, and there's a wide lot of information there to take in. Well, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a difficult topic to cover, because there is, unfortunately, you have to do a wee bit of theory. It does get a bit heavy at times, uh, unfortunately, but uh, I tried to put in a wee bit of the other surrounding archaeology so as to lift it just a little bit, you know? Yeah, no, I don't think it was heavy, no. I think it was great. I think oh, it, was, it was just right, you know, and, 
your students are very uh, lucky to have you, to be honest with you, you know. Uh -oh. and, uh, <laughs> just don't sit all agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, that's great. Listen, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I say I'm more than happy to talk to you at any stage in the future. Uh, I'll maybe get to meet some of you in, 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 in the flesh. Yeah, well, if you're ever up this week, I'm just shouting. We'll take Absolutely you to places up here. You know, oh, I'd love to, yes. There's some great places. Uh, great places. Place. Yeah. That's, that's all for now. Thank you very much for coming on. Okay, right. Good luck now. All the best, mate. Take care. All the best. Bye -bye.